Father, let your voice may be so clear to us so that we can understand. Open the eyes of our heart so that we may be able to see you, that you are speaking to us, so making us so clear that your purpose is, Lord, your Lord intentions, whatever it may be, Lord. I just commit, Lord, our Lord, uh, uh, our dear brother Vinosha into your loving hands, Father, that we want to, Lord, hear clear voice, Father. We thank you, Lord. And we also remember the people that to be joining also remember those people, Father. We all of us want to, Lord, understand you, know you more in a better way, Lord, so that we walk, Lord, before you blameless, Father. We want to see that you are speaking to us, Lord. Have mercy upon us, Lord. We plead for your grace and mercy, Lord. Yes, Lord, we cannot understand unless you open your, your Lord, wisdom, your grace, and your, Lord, uh, intentions, Lord. Please have mercy upon us. Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Sir, I had requested uh, one of the participants to recap. Yeah, very what good. We heard through the last two weeks. Very good, very good. So, uh, Konig, shortly within the next uh, five minutes or so, from the last two meetings, if you can please recap for us. And good evening, sir, and good evening, everyone. Uh, two weeks before, we had seen from Sir's second uh, talk that uh, we saw the theology of vocation, uh, career, and job, and that is, job is uh, something which is work career which is done with excellence, but a vocation is a calling from God, similar aspect to a narrative, narrative and the grand narrative. And we also saw what is it, uh, the primary vocation which is God calling us to follow Jesus and it is not just an ideology but to follow a person. It is an ideology, uh, people like Hitler, Mao and Lenin followed great ideologies but it made them monsters. Uh, we compared uh, even Karl Marx and uh, Robespierre with uh, Saint Ignatius of Loyola and how they uh, followed a person, rather than, how he followed a person rather than an ideology. And we saw that there are three parts to the call. There's a general call of God, an individual call and a corporate call from the community. Uh, and, uh, because, and there are challenges to the call. Because there are four challenges. Vocation builds character by helping us to lose four things. That is control, security, self-identity, and immediate gratification. So that we can participate in his calling as pilgrims. Uh, I hope that was the last two weeks. Thank you. Is that a fair recap, sir? Ah, yes, I think so. Uh, there was one more, isn't it, on sacred, secular... Dichotomy? I, I didn't do that. I think you did it in the first week, sir. First week, okay. Okay, fine. Over to you, sir, now. Okay. Okay, uh, we are going to look at uh, some more challenges of the workplace and not only challenges, we are trying to understand uh, vocation a little better. Uh, this is the summary of what I'm hoping to talk to you. One is don't underestimate your calling and I'll give you four bullet points to understand that. And then I'm going to tell you about how to build motivation in yourself and in, the, uh, in others in your organization. And then uh, I've already talked about one of those things, postponing gratification, but I'm going to talk to you about how to become emotionally stable. Now, this is a very important uh, 
idea and I'd like to spend a little time so that all of you understand that properly. And then uh, I'm going to talk about some of the enemies of the workplace, indecision, distraction, the lust for power and competitiveness. Now, uh, have I also talked to you about emotional stability before in my first, second lecture? I didn't, isn't it? Okay, maybe you can, when I'm telling you, you can remind me if I've talked to you about it before or not. So let's start with underestimating your calling. Uh, these are the four bullet points for underestimating your calling. Your calling uh, will have ripple effects and I will explain what that means and I'll give you an example in the Bible where God actually refers to this ripple effect and then uh, I'm going to talk to you about your work or your vocation is actually officially a partnership with God it's actually a covenant with God and then I'm going to tell you that uh, when your work, uh, your vocation is actually being a friend of God, you know, unofficially means in your relationship with God. And then I'm going to tell you about it is, it is extremely rewarding to have this great vocation from God. And let's look at these four bullet points that help us understand that our calling is an is inestimable value. Now, there was a point where I think some kind of conversation like this would have happened between Isaiah and between God. Isaiah would have said, Lord, I'm just talking to these uh, Israelites all the time and nothing much is happening and nobody is changing. I don't know whether I'm, any, I'm of any use. I don't know whether there's any use talking to, them, talking to them about you anymore. So God says, okay, you think it is too light a thing to be talking to the tribes of Jacob and to bring back the preserve of Israel. But I'm telling you, that you will become a light for the nations, that my salvation will reach to the end of the earth. So this is what God is telling Isaiah when he seems to be discouraged about the possible value of his work. Now, do you all feel that sometimes I feel too? Do you feel that you're getting nowhere? that you are serving God in vain, nothing much is happening, that this is what God is telling you. He's saying, I will use you to transform the whole world. Now, in Isaiah's case, you remember that the Ethiopian eunuch was reading the book of Isaiah when Philip met him. And Ethiopia was the first country in Africa to become Christian. And then it went to the other parts of North Africa. And then, of course, Book of Isaiah has been translated into a thousand languages. And everybody reads Isaiah and everybody is encouraged. Uh, so you can see how Isaiah was a light to the nations and how his word of salvation has reached to the ends of the earth. And so also, God is telling us, when you feel like saying, I think I'm useless, I think my work has no value, God is saying, please don't underestimate what I'm asking you to do. You are going to be a light for the nations and my salvation is going to reach the ends of the earth through you. You know, it is like a ripple effect. You put a very small pebble in a big pond, but the whole pond is covered by the ripples. You know, it spreads to every corner of the pond. So also, 
what little you do will have major consequences. So don't ever underestimate your calling. <clears throat> and then I was telling you, a calling is actually a your calling is actually a covenant with God. That means it is an official partnership. There is actually a, a spiritual uh, document, you know, sealed and signed. Because, you know, this covenant is a very official thing. Now, in the covenant, God made a partnership with Abraham. God called Abraham, it was his vocation, and made a covenant with him that you and your children's children will follow me and uh, I will bless you and make you all a blessing to the whole world. And that was the partnership with Abraham. Abraham and his dis descendants failed in the partnership. They did not keep up their side of the partnership. So they needed to be killed. But God did not want the covenant to be cancelled. So he renewed the covenant. That is what we call the new covenant or the new testament. And God renewed the covenant by dying on the cross himself instead of, you know, the Israelites. So also the covenant that God, God makes with us for the vocation, for the calling, is as strong as this covenant. So don't ever take it lightly. It is a covenant sealed and signed by the blood of God himself. And then, <clears throat> you know, people who are called become friends of God. You know, uh, our bosses, our earthly bosses, they don't always treat us properly. They treat us like servants or slaves. Uh, they don't treat us like friends. But our, our heavenly boss, he will make us his friends. That means it's an unofficial partnership. You can put your arms around him and talk to him. Tell him about all sorts of things. And in return, God will share from his side. So this is what uh, God is uh, telling the two other angels who are with him. Shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? This was before Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, and then in Amos, it says, For the Lord God does nothing without revealing his secrets to his servants, the prophets. That means... We are his friends. And when you have this calling, and when you're confused, call on your friend. You know, you can say, Lord, I'm supposed to be uh, your called person. I'm here. I've got this work to do. I'm really confused. I don't know how to take it forward. I have many challenges. There are people who obstructing. There are people whose voices I don't know whether to believe or not. Can you please help me? And God, as a friend, believe me, he will give you tips and he'll give you wisdom. He'll give you that secret knowledge that take this decision because that is good decision. And you will be able to take that decision. So you become a friend of God when you have a calling from God. So don't ever take your calling uh, lightly. Finally, and this is the greatest, uh, the greatest bullet in the four bullet points. Fear not, for I am your shield and your exceeding great reward. Uh, you know, our greatest reward is not silver or gold or things to eat or to enjoy. It is God himself. And what more reward can you want? This is what God is telling Abraham who was called of him. He called Abraham out of the land of Ur of the Chaldeans. And then he was going through lots of difficulties. 
he became discouraged because Lot left him. And then there was a battle with so many kings in the plains of Sodom and Gomorrah. And Lot had got the well-watered plains of Sodom and Gomorrah. It was level and there was plenty of water. And the portion he took was a hilly portion, not really well watered, but more of a desert. And so Abraham was a little insecure. There were many enemies. There were many kings who were battling with him. And it seemed to him that he got the wrong end of the stick. Now, how often does this happen to us? You know, we feel we have followed God but we have to come to a dry place. Everybody else is in a green area. Everybody else has got plenty of water, but I am in a desert area and I've got nothing and I'm very insecure. And then at that time, you must remember that God is telling Abraham and the same thing he will be telling you. Fear not, I am your shield and your exceeding great reward. You know, what more can you want of God, you know, except uh, to give you his very own self to you. So these are some four bullet points in helping you understand why you should not take your calling lightly. <clears throat> and then, uh, you know, I want to talk to you about motivation, how to motivate people and how to motivate yourself. You know, we ourselves, sometimes, a lot of the times, we can feel completely demotivated. We can feel, well, I don't think we are going anywhere. And maybe your employees or people you work with also may feel demotivated. And this is what uh, the lesson we learn from God himself. Uh, before that, I tell you, before I tell you, here's a quotation. Uh, painting the big picture makes for inspirational communication. Focus on the big picture and not on the process. Now, do you understand what I'm saying? I will, I will help you understand. Imagine you are recruiting people for a shipbuilding company, okay? You are in charge, you are the CEO of a shipbuilding company. And then this is what this French philosopher is saying, if you want to build a ship, don't summon people to buy wood, prepare tools, distribute jobs, and organize the work. Teach people the yearning for the wide, boundless ocean. That means teach them to love the ocean, the big picture, and then you will find that they become very motivated about buying wood and preparing tools and working and organizing and all that sort of thing. So also, this is what Jesus himself did. When Jesus came, started his public ministry at the age of 30, he said, these are the first things he said, the kingdom of God is at hand. You know, how motivating that can be. You know, the Israelites were under the Egyptian rule and authority, and then they were under uh, the Assyrian authorities and the Babylonian authorities, and then so many uh, small time Philistine authorities, and then under authority of Rome. And all the governments, all the kingdoms they had were evil. And they were saying, Lord, when will this end? When will we have proper government? When will we have justice and prosperity and peace? And here is Jesus coming and saying, the kingdom of God is at hand. There will be justice. There will be no poverty. There will be no suffering. Repent and believe in the gospel. So this is how... He motivated people, uh, the big picture. So also, in your work, you don't tell people, see, you have to come exactly at 8 o'clock or 7.30, and then 
you must do this and then you have to do this and then you have to do this. Uh, I will punish you if you do this, but you must do this and you must do this. You know, if you keep talking about the process all the time, then you will not inspire them. But if you tell them, we are here so that this community will find joy and prosperity and peace. We are working here so that there is healing in this community, so that there is less pain and there is more joy. There are no infant mortality rates and there are no maternal deaths. This is why we are working. So you, you create that big picture and then you talk about the process. So, uh, and when you are discouraged, what you have to tell yourself is, I am working for the king of kings. I'm his servant. I have a covenant with him. He's my friend. He's my gift and my reward. It's not simply my salary. God is my reward. And so you tell yourself these big things, the big picture things, and you will find that as you keep telling yourself this over and over again, week after week, month after month and years, you reach a point where you are truly motivated and you cannot be discouraged anymore. <clears throat> the first things Jesus said in a lot of the Gospels, in Mark he said, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. And Matthew he said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And in Luke he said, he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there will be no end. So, you know, he was talking about the kingdom all the time because he wanted to inspire and motivate people. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> I think a lot of people have joined after I started. Uh, would there be a need to quickly recap the four bullet points? Can some of you do that? Morning. Morning. You want to do it? Okay, sir. No one else wants. Please, please. The four points which we are looking today are uh, uh, on uh, what is uh, not to underestimate our calling. That is the four points are we have, a, it, God works with a ripple effect. Uh, he says it in Isaiah 40, uh, 49 verse 6. Uh, that how, how each one of us can be used by God to impact the whole world. And how Isaiah was used to even impact the eunuch who was, uh, the Ethiopian eunuch. Uh, the second thing is he calls us to a covenant uh, as a partnership. Uh, he did it with Abraham and the descendants. I said descendants couldn't keep it, but now it has been renewed by Jesus dying on, on the cross for us. Uh, that's the high level of his calling. The third is we are called to be his friends. Uh, he, uh, he won't hide things from us. He will give us the real secret knowledge which comes from him to fulfill and take the right decisions. And the final thing is he is our great reward. Uh, we may lose other things, but he is our best reward. Those are four things. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. <clears throat> okay, and then one more, one more uh, uh, comment about uh, the big picture. You know, the first things he said and the first miracle he did was convert water into wine. It was a, a celebration. You know, it was not an accident that the first miracle was converting water into wine, celebrating a marriage. Uh, I'm sure he had the great marriage of the heavenly bride and the bride of Christ in mind in Revelation chapter 21, uh, when he converted wine, uh, water into wine. And so you want to remember the celebration, you know, you think of the celebration when you're going through difficulties. You have to tell yourself, there will be time when I will be celebrating. 
uh, and God himself is going to be my husband and we are going to have a great time together. So uh, the big picture again, you know, it is these big pictures that will sustain us through the more dreary parts of our work. Okay, <clears throat> I think uh, some of you may have heard me while I was doing this session for, uh, for, for Victor, you know, in the, what do you call that? Leadership CCL or something. Leadership uh, for change. Yeah, leadership for change, yes. Now, uh, uh, this is an extremely important idea. And I want you to uh, just pay a little attention so that you understand it. And if you don't, please ask me so I'll try and use better language. <clears throat> David had an extremely tumultuous life. His life was full of ups and downs. Uh, David was called, you know, when he was anointed king, that is equivalent of he's being called. He was called into kingship. Like we were all, uh, you know, all, all of us are called so also David was called into kingship. And soon after that, he had to battle Goliath. And then he was chosen by Saul and he fought many battles. But then there was one particular battle where he had to fight Philistines to be able to marry Micah. And then there he was disappointed because Saul changed his mind. And then later on, how Saul became jealous and began to, to hunt him down, how he to run away. And he ran away from him for, he was hiding for 17 years. And while he was hiding, one of the times, the Amalekites invaded his camp and took away all his things, including all the women and children. And then, David was able to recover all of that. And then he was made, uh, he was, after the death of Saul, he was made king. Uh, then he sinned. And then he had to be restored. And then his son Absalom tried to kill him. And he ran away from him. And then his son was killed and then he was brought back. And so, you know, he had so many ups and downs. And normally, if we had to go through so much of pain, especially the hiding for 17 years, we would have been greatly depressed. Uh, how, did his, how did he manage to remain sane, you know, without antidepressants, without a psychiatrist? How did he cope with these emotions? We see here, now, I want to look at the Psalms. May his children be fatherless and his wife a widow. May his posterity be cut off. May his name be blotted out in the second generation. They're not Psalms which could have been there. They're not nice Psalms, are they? Uh, how can David, who is a man of God, a called person, write Psalms like this? Okay, so let's Let's try and remove this psalm from our Bibles. But then there's another psalm, Psalm 5, which is also somewhat similar. Make them bear the guilt, O Lord. Let them fall over their own counsels. Uh, <clears throat> and then again in Psalm 40, uh, he says, let, let those be turned back and brought to dishonor who desire my hurt. And then Psalm 56, for the crime, will they escape? Cast them down, the peoples, O Lord. Then he goes on again in Psalm 35. You can't remove all the Psalms. So there has to be some meaning behind all this, all this imprecatory Psalms. That means Psalms of cursing. Again, Psalm 35, it says, let them be put to shame and dishonor who seek my life, and so on. Uh, and finally ends by saying, and let the net that he hid ensnare him. Let him fall into it 
to his destruction. And then again in Psalm 69, let their own table before them become a snare. When they are at peace, let it become a trap. Let their eyes be darkened. That means he's saying, let them become blind. And let their loins tremble continually. Uh, pour out the indignation upon them, you know. These are all the list of the imprecatory psalms, you know, so many of them. So obviously, God had some plan in putting all these psalms together. So I want us to just uh, reflect and give me some responses why we have these psalms of cursing in the Bible. I think that David was sharing the depth of his sorrow to his maker. Uh, David was sharing? The depth of his sorrow. Uh, his sorrow, yes, with God. Okay. Okay. Would you say that he really wanted these people to be destroyed? I think he was looking for his release rather than anything else. And Do you think that he really wanted all these people to be destroyed or come to harm? If yes, why? If no, why? Give me some proof. Most of the people who were doing harm to him were people who were supposed to be close to him yes. like his father-in-law like his own son yes so where we see that when they really died uh, david really wept over it so yes yes so it was not an easy thing for them to i mean them to be yes. literally punished so yes. yeah very good uh, santosh there is we have strong evidence that David did not want Saul to die. For example, three times he had an opportunity to kill Saul. Am I right or not? Yes. Three times he had an opportunity to kill Saul, but Saul did not kill him and forgave him. So what does that mean about about uh, these prayers. He was praying his emotions to God. He was saying, Lord, it is not, it is, we are supposed to uh, understand that what Saul was actually praying, these Psalms were really prayers. Uh, he was praying his emotions to God, like children. Uh, when they're angry, they will tell the mother, you're bad, you're very bad, I won't talk to you. But do they actually mean it? No, they don't actually mean that, do they? And then they will cry, you know, they may even hit the mother and say, you're very bad, very bad, then they will start crying, and then they will embrace the mother. So we know that human beings are like that, and God knows that we humans are like that, that we need emotional support and help. So uh, David poured out his emotions fully without couching his emotions in any religious language. You know, he was not making a show of religion when talking to God. He was saying, Lord, this is how I feel. I feel like just killing him. I feel that they should be all destroyed. I want the children to be destroyed. I want them, them to become blind. So, you know, he was saying these things, but he was saying only what he felt like, not what he willed like. Because what he willed like 
was very different. When he actually met Saul, he forgave him three times. So it was not an accident. And when Saul died, he felt very sorry. He didn't want Absalom to be killed. And when he died, he felt extremely sorrowful. So we know that David was doing this to manage his emotions, but he did not will harm to his enemies. How many of you are with me? Have you all understood what I'm saying? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, now you can manage your emotions in four ways. You can suppress your anger. You can say, no, no, I shouldn't be angry. He's he is bad. No, no, no. I mustn't think like that. No, I mustn't think like that. You can keep suppressing it, but then if you suppress it, what will happen? It will come up in some other way. It will come up. It will come out as a skin rash. You know, or your you will have some autoimmune disease or something, or some emotional problem you'll have. If you express your anger to the world, like people do in Facebook and Twitter and in gossip or in conversations, uh, you are actually uh, you are actually bringing a bad name. You're doing damage to your people, to other people, because you are putting their name down. You know, the goodwill they may have, what little goodwill they may have, you're destroying. And so you're guilty of that. And it is not a good thing to do, but people do this all the time. If you look at Facebook and Twitter, you'll find that. And then you can take action. You can just kill the guy, you know, and take revenge. And people do all the time, this all the time. But you can also pray your emotions. You can allow your emotions to go up as a fragrant offering to God. Now that is called sublimation. So the way you manage your emotions is you sublimate your emotions. You allow it to go up, go up to the heavens. Uh, the word sublimation comes from uh, chemistry, you know, iodine crystals and dry ice or solid carbon. When it is frozen, it is in a solid state. But when you take it out of the freezer, it will not become liquid. It will not wallow on the ground as liquid. It will go up into the heavens as vapor. So that is sublimation. That means when you are upset and angry, don't wallow on the ground. Don't tell other people and uh, don't try other earthly tricks. Let it go up as a prayer to God. And Pray your emotions to God and be open and be frank. Don't bluff God. Don't say, Lord, uh, uh, I, am, I am angry, but, uh, but you know, I, you know, you don't couch. Just tell God exactly what you feel. And of course, you apologize saying, Lord, I'm human. I'm feeling these things. Please heal me. Please help me. Please heal me completely so that I don't have any anger left. Actually, this is the way to heal your bad emotions. When you pray your emotions to God, and when it goes up, grace comes down and heals your mind and your memory and your emotions. Now, uh, there was a Cambodian pastor who was... Uh, uh, imprisoned along with uh, all the teachers and intellectual people, you know, Pol Pot killed 40%. He was a communist uh, leader in the likes of Mao Tse Tung. And he did what is called a cultural revolution. Kill all the bourgeois, all the upper, you know, upper caste people, learned, doctors, teachers, pastors, you know, sort of kill all of them and keep only the laborers alive, the proletariat. 
So he decimated 40% of the population. But some people he did not kill. He used them in the prisons. He imprisoned them. And so this pastor was used as a, a toilet cleaner. He had to clean the toilets. There were hundreds of toilets. And he had to clean the toilets day in and day out. And so this pastor says, uh, it was a glorious time of meeting with God. There was no soldiers disturbing me at that area. There was no disturbance. Nobody wanted to be there unless they wanted to use the toilets. So nobody talked to me and I had God to myself fully. I was able to talk to God all the time. And so he says, after a while, he didn't, he couldn't feel the smell of the toilets because he was busy talking to God. And so this is an example of sublimation, how you have a challenge and you take the challenge and you let it go up to the heavens. And the grace of God will come down on you and heal you and help you. Uh, the laments are a form of sublimation. Now, Isaiah, he said, Lord, why have you, why did you do this to Israel? They were your people and you allowed them to do this and you allowed them to do that. Just one minute. Hello. Konja, I am busy. 15 minutes after certain la. In Argenta. Sir. Sorry, that was uh, something urgent. So, uh, Jeremiah also was lamenting. He was weeping. He's called the weeping prophet. He was allowing his emotions to go up. Jeremiah was weeping. David was angry. Isaiah was uh, confused. All these emotions were allowed to go up into the heavens. And the grace of God would come down, I'm sure, and help them. Jesus also, he said, uh, Lord, Lord, why have you forsaken me? You know, had God actually forsaken him? No. But then he's, what he meant was, Lord, I feel as if you have forsaken me. And that was his lament. So uh, I'm sure that as he lamented, the grace of God came down on him and strengthened him. So the way to manage our emotions is to sublimate them. And this is the most important thing. Uh, you have to pray frankly, tell God exactly what you feel. If you don't feel like praying, this is because you don't pray what you feel. This is what Rick Warren says. Please pray what you feel. Be Because our God is a God of reality. You know, you want your children to tell you exactly. Suppose you have a, a eight-year-old daughter or a son or something, goes to school and comes back and is crying. You want him to tell you exactly what you feel. You don't want him to spiritualize something and tell you. You want him to tell you exactly how we feel so that you understand. So also, our God is a God of reality. He wants to know how you feel because he cares for you. And when you do this, you become emotionally stable. And emotional stability is a very important feature in the workplace. Most of the frustrations in the workplace are not simply because of salary or not because of not being able to understand your job so well. It is a lot of it is because of emotional difficulties with the other people or with the boss or whatever. So, okay, uh, we have, uh, this is we are now moving into the emotional stability. I gave you one tip, which is uh, sublimating. The other tip for emotional stability is postponing gratification. We have seen this in the earlier. Uh, Okay. Uh, 
Okay. Now uh, we are going to another another important area in the workplace, and that is indecision as as wandering, not able to take decisions. <clears throat> there are some people who are not able to take decisions at work. They are overwhelmed. They keep postponing decision making because I will tell you why. But uh, one very important reason is given here by James. He says a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Uh, there, are there are people who in the workplace will not progress because they are afraid of taking decisions. So what they will do is they will hold on to the status quo. You know, they will just keep doing whatever they are doing all the time. There are a lot of people like that. They will see opportunities to grow, but they will not take decisions because, because, of, because they are afraid, primarily. And James says, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. When you are spiritually double-minded, that means there are some people who have a sense of vocation, but they are not sure whether they want to continue following God. They will say, maybe one year I'll try this and then I will do something else. I will just give it a little try. You know, so they're not really sure about whether to follow God or not. And when you are unstable in that way, it will affect the rest of your uh, decision-making ability. Um, and what they will do is they will become busy and busy and busy so they don't have to take a decision. Here it says, Lord Ronald said nothing. He flung himself from the room, flung himself upon his horse and rode madly off in all directions. You know, a lot of young people don't take decisions uh, about a vocation or a calling. They don't want to commit themselves. And they will, therefore, because they don't want to challenge, they don't want their conscience to challenge them, they keep themselves very busy. So this is what Lord Ronald did. He used to flung, flung himself upon his horse and ride off in all directions. That means in no directions. He was busy doing nothing. <clears throat> Uh, this is a model, a French philosopher created this model. Uh, there are two bundles of hay in front of a donkey. And both are equidistant from the donkey. And the donkey will be paralyzed by indecision and he will die of starvation. Now that look, feels like a good joke, but actually it is a summary of many lives. Many young people don't take a decision about calling or a vocation. They keep postponing it. They look at their vocation and then they look at the world. They look at the vocation and say, isn't that interesting to follow God and do that? And then they look at the world and say, but you know, this is also very interesting. Let me think about it a little more. And they keep on vacillating and then a kind of a paralysis sets in and then they become too old and then they die. So uh, it's very important not only to take decisions about the vocation, but to continue taking the decision every day and in every opportunity that there is for growth. Uh, paralysis of commitment or commitment phobia. Many people don't want to commit themselves to following God or a vocation because they're afraid. They're saying, suppose I start doing that, then I will lose out on so many other, other things. All the wonderful things in the world I will miss. So I don't want to take the decision now. So, you know, they slowly have a commitment phobia. Uh, <clears throat> but 
a, a real Christian doesn't need to be afraid of making a commitment because even if you make a mistake in your vocation, the God will overrule and correct our mistakes. You know, he will reroute you. Like in the GPS, you know, if you, um, <clears throat> if you make a mistake while driving, the GPS will recalculate and then it will reroute you so that you reach the same destination. So also, a Christian is never really afraid of making a mistake, never afraid of making decisions because the God we love will overrule and correct our mistakes. And then another danger in calling, another danger in calling is a, a distraction. <clears throat> um, we become, we refuse to engage by becoming busy with something less important. Now, this is what uh, Blaise Pascal said. He said, I've discovered that all the unhappiness of men arises from one single fact that they cannot stay quietly in their own chamber. People love to be distracted and to wander rather than engage in taking serious decisions in life. So if you have not been able to take a decision about vocation, it is because maybe you have kept yourself distracted all the time. There is no expedient to which a man will not resort to avoid the real labor of thinking. In this book, The Pilgrim's Progress, you know, these are all the, these are all the stations he went through, starting from the city of destruction to the celestial city. But it was in Vanity Fair that he stayed for a long time because Vanity Fair people told him, okay, yes, I know you want to go to the celestial city. Don't worry, don't worry. You just take rest, just enjoy for a time. Just relax for a few days. So that strategy was distraction. It was not prevention. No, it was not preventing him from going to the celestial city because if they had tried that, he would have said no. But it was distracting him, saying, okay, you go to the celestial city, but not now. Uh, the senior devil is teaching the junior devil. If you want people of the generation to keep wandering, then keep them busy with mobile phone, Facebook, restaurants, and TV. Don't ask him to commit murder because your client will not commit murder. He's telling a junior devil how to tempt a Christian. Don't tell him to murder. Don't ask him to steal the bank. Uh, don't ask him to rape. Don't ask him to do terrible things. Ask, just distract him. And this is a strategy that seems to work a lot with Christians. <clears throat> Uh, redeeming the time because the days are evil. You know how important it is that we don't get distracted because we need to redeem that time. One of Satan's greatest weapons against our generation sacrifice the best things in life by spending time doing things that are good but not so important. This way, we keep wandering without achieving anything. Good is the enemy of the best. Uh, I'll stop there. Uh, there are some more quotations along the same theme, how religion can also be a distraction. Those organizers of charity did not care for the poor. You know, you can, you can be working in EHA, but you may not have love for the poor or love for God. Uh, those who want to prove the existence of God, but don't really care for God himself. Uh, you can be an evangelist, but you may not have any love for Christ. Uh, so, you know, this is another form of distraction. You know, you fall in love with the process rather than the reason why you're doing it.
but god is a great wonderful god even if you are wandering he will hound us off he's trying to hound us all the time and we are trying to run away from him all the time but if you you can read this poem it's that free on the web the hound of heaven this is short poem but very well written uh this is the poem john stott how was he converted he was converted by this book the hound of heaven the greatest story of a wanderer you know the prodigal son so we have hope because we have a great and a wonderful god i'll stop here because i think uh, uh i'll do it in the next uh next next session we have one more session right yeah yes sir yeah i'll finish that and then take the other last one like in the last session i just wanted some minutes for questions and clarifications thank you ramit sir yeah now open for the participants to unmute and ask sir if there is anything to ask what are some practical ways in which we can discover some of the distractions of our life um i guess uh, it's a very practical question but uh, the answers are not so difficult to find if you just map your 24 hours a day and do it for a week you will know what is distracting you the most often worry and anxiety is also a distraction we fall prey to that uh something that i have also to learn and i have learned a little bit about how to cast your care on god and then forget it but it's a very hard lesson to learn but it is also a very important distraction among other distractions can you share in the group what are the some things that distract you folk sir i have a question i don't know if it will be relevant uh, here if not uh, please ignore it i was just talking to a friend in a government medical college yeah uh, uh, like so we were talking about this government transfers and all so most of the people have taken transfer paying lakhs of money to the government and it is like going in a vicious cycle you know then they keep taking money from the patient bribe and things like that to fill in the gap you know is there a way to get over it or oh, transfer to another job you mean to a better no um, uh, see this guy is uh, post md dm and all they get just posted in public health center where there's no equipment or anything right uh, so they all look for some transfer to a city where they also can have some private practice in a attached to a medical college and things like that yes so uh, you know this goes about in cycles it's not only the profession of medicine uh, look at police academies and yes. any of this government trainings it's like you no know, this is coming about as a, a evolution in our country yes yeah what you're saying is you have to pay a bribe and then you want the money back so yes. you you charge the patients and you take money from them when you're not supposed to take and so on exactly okay yeah i think uh in one of my sessions i have talked about legitimate suffering and neurotic suffering uh you have to choose what kind of suffering you want 
you cannot choose no suffering because there is no such thing. There are only two categories, legitimate suffering and neurotic suffering. Legitimate suffering is continuing in your post. You can request for a transfer. You can talk to them, convince them, use arguments, but you don't bribe them. And if you don't get transferred, then that is legitimate suffering. Because then you say, God wants me to be here. Because uh, I tried my best to change. I've talked to my boss. I tried to tell him the reasons why he's not able to do it or doesn't want to do it. Maybe he wants money, but I'm not willing to pay money. So God wants me to be here. I'll continue. That is legitimate suffering. But if you pay bribe and then go to another place and then take money, then what happens is you lose meaning. And loss of meaning produces neurotic suffering. Then, you know, when you have a problem, you will say, I don't know why I'm doing all this, you know. It's a terrible, terrible life is terrible. There's no meaning at all. Because you've lost the meaning. You've, you've thrown the meaning away. So you have only two, op, two kinds of meanings you can have. So I would say that you have to... Uh, Any other, any other questions? Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, how can we differentiate between seeing the big picture and uh, daydreaming? Or not to fall into daydreaming, sir. Yeah. Actually, uh, daydreaming is like imagination. The difference between imagination and uh, daydreaming is when you're daydreaming about the right things, it is imagination, it is constructive, it is good. When you're, day, when you're thinking about, imagining about wrong things, then that is daydreaming. Like for example, I can, I can be daydreaming about how to somehow, you know, get people to um, come to the hospital faster or how can I somehow make sure that there's no disease in this area at all. And you can be, you know, imagining and spend time imagining and daydreaming. I think that is very good because that is, that is what creates, produces creativity and creates enterprise. So daydreaming for good things is a good thing. It's a constructive thing. It is a tool that God has given us to plan and to improve. But when you're doing it for the wrong motives, then that is bad. So daydreaming in itself is not bad. Uh, there are some questions here. Uh, uh, yeah, one, one suggestion was share market uh, well, as a distraction. Yes, I think it's possible for people to be uh, doing that. It need not be necessarily wrong, provided it does not sort of uh, consume you and use up all your time. If you have discipline and say, I'm going to do it only for 15 minutes or something, then that's fine. Uh, 
And then there is another question, how can I get rid of past failures which pulling down, eroding the mood? Yes, I mean, um, the answer to that is that uh, what Paul says, forgetting all that is behind, that means forgetting the failures, not only the sins. You have to forget the sins because God has already forgiven. And when God has forgiven, God forgets. And if God forgets, then you also have to forget. There's no point in remembering because in God's book itself has been blotted out. Then what is the point in your having, your putting it down in your little mind? So sins are forgotten and for, for, forgiven, forgotten and blotted out. But bad memories, memories of failures will, re, will remain. And then you have to keep fighting it each time you have a memory of that by telling yourself, yes, I am a failure and I will be continue to be a failure as long as God is not with me. But if God is with me, I will not be a failure. So, you know, you're reminding yourself of your own fallibility at the same time encouraging yourself that because now God is with you, you will not fail anymore. So I guess it's a battle, slowly but surely a battle that you can and will win. Hello, sir. Yes, please go on. Uh, sir, uh, sir, actually, uh, I, I want to ask one question. Like uh, the uh, Zin Buridans, as yes, you have mentioned, like about the indecision uh, yes. taking. So, like, even uh, in our life, sometimes uh, there are some situations where we feel like which one to choose. Like, my mind is 50%, I want to go this side, and 50% that side. So, as you have uh, explained it beautifully, the donkey, uh, he ended up in uh, dying in starvation because he could not decide anything. So, if, if we go in that stage, uh, what to do? Like, uh, we sh should, shall we choose the one or like uh, anything means rather than uh, not choosing anything? Like what to do? Like, yeah, so. Uh, it's a very good and an honest question. And uh, I'm sure that we all have felt like that. Uh, I felt like that before taking many decisions. Uh, but what helped me was the verse in Matthew 6.33, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things will be added unto you. That means if you choose the right bundle of hay, then not only will you get that bundle, you will get the other bundle also. You will get both the bundles. But if you choose the wrong bundle, then not only will you not get the, that bundle, the other bundle also will be gone. You will get nothing. So this was seek ye first the kingdom of God means that you can get both bundles if you seek the kingdom of God first. Seek the kingdom of God first, the kingdom bundle first, and all these other bundles will be added unto you. So do you follow what I'm saying? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, sir. You, you'll get both the bundles if you choose the Kingdom of God bundle. Yes, sir. Uh, there's another question. How can we express our emotions in prayer, contradicting the word like pray for those who persecute you? Uh, yes, you can. Uh, you can say, Lord, I feel like killing him. I'm so angry. But Lord, I know that you're a loving God. And in my heart, there is no love. There is only anger. So Lord, please give me love. Please help me so that I can love him, so that I can pray for him. You know, 
that is the way to go that is the way to pray you start with honesty saying lord i feel like murdering him i feel like doing this to him i feel like doing that to him but lord you know there is no good in me and i know lord that you love and you are a god of love and i know that you care for him so lord please give me an emotion uh that is worthy of your uh great calling help me to love him you know so that is a way to do it you're starting honestly because that that there's another prayer lord i have no faith but help my unbelief you know this is the same thing lord i have no love for him help me to love him i have hatred for him lord but teach me to give up on hatred and teach me to love him so that is the way to pray ah uh, yes uh uh any more questions thank you so much okay there is one question here uh <clears throat> until what time should i should i submit to my boss uh you know many people think that uh, i'll submit to god but i will not submit to any human being now that is not really humility for god's sake we are servants of other people so we have to submit to the boss but when he says something that is uh wrong when he asks you to do something wrong then you very humbly say sir i want to talk to you and then talk to him and says i have read i am a christian i have read that this is what what i should be doing and what you're saying seems to clash with what i believe what should i do you know you do it gently rather than saying you are evil you are asking me to do evil i will not obey you you know so do it with the spirit of humility uh i don't know whether i have answered that question or not sorry uh santosh you were saying something i think he's uh, left the meeting sir he's not here okay okay um, do we have any more questions uh, we done uh, dr cheryan can i ask you to pray and close the session i'll pray Father in heaven, we just want to thank you for this nice day you have given to us, Lord. Thank you for your servant, Dr. Vinod Shah, and the way he could uh, make things so easy to understand, Lord. Uh, especially, uh, we like the illustrations and like the pictures which he showed, Lord. Help us to take the right decisions, Lord. Help us to walk with you. Help us to listen to you. Help us not to go on the wrong tangent, wrong direction in our life, and uh, help us not to love. anything in this world more than uh, you lord pray be with every person every person who is struggling uh, especially those who are young people and also old people we have to make decisions every day lord help us lord with our life we give our life in your hands help us to tell this to other people also and help them all jesus name we pray Amen.